Hello, and welcome to our special webinar. I am so happy to have you with us this evening. My name is Thomas Farrington. I'm the president and founder of the Prostate Health Education Network. And uh, it's, uh, I also want to uh, always begin by uh, thanking our sponsors. Uh, you saw the, uh, the sponsors as we rotated the charts and uh, we're excited about a, uh, an exciting program this evening. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things happening with prostate cancer uh, and the, uh, the, the American Cancer Society just released new data. This data shows that uh, prostate cancer, new cases will increase by 30% for 2021. That is an alarming number. In fact, that is a frightening number. So uh, when we saw that number, uh, we decided to put together an expert panel to, uh, to really dig into this information, to try to understand uh, what it means, how we got here, and how we uh, proceed to uh, make things better. So, uh, so I, I'm going to introduce our panelists, but first let me introduce how we will conduct the program. Uh, we will have presentation and a panel discussion uh, during the first part of the program. Uh, however, during this time, if you would like to submit a question, you can submit a question in the Q&A. Uh, and uh, we will answer that question once we finish our discussion. So we will not stop the discussion to answer each question, but we will all your question. So feel free as a question comes into your mind, you can jot it down. So, uh, so again, we are very excited about this program. Uh, and the first thing I'd like to do is to introduce uh, our guests and panelists. And uh, I'm going to start by introducing Dr. Ruth Ezioni. Uh, Dr. Ezioni is a professor of public health sciences at Frederick Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And uh, she's also a member of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Prostate Cancer Early Detection Guideline Panel. Uh, she and I serve on that panel together. Uh, Dr. Ezioni is a biostatistician who primarily focuses on cancer screening and early detection. Much of her work is in the area of prostate and breast cancer, where she develops methods for evaluating diagnostic tests, creates mathematical models to reflect the impact of screening tests on the incident and mortality rates of these cancers. Dr. Ezioni leads the biostatistics core uh, for the National Cancer Institute funded multi-center Northwest Prostate Cancer Specialized Program of Research Excellence, or SPOR. And she has a long-standing interest in researching, tracking, and working to eliminate health disparities. Uh, Dr. Ezion and I uh, have had the opportunity to, to collaborate before, and I am so happy. And Dr. Ezion, thank you so much for being with us today. And then I would like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Kevin Moses. Uh, Dr. Moses is a social professor, Department of Urology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Uh, he's also a member of the NCCN Prostate Cancer Early Detection Guideline Panel. Uh, Dr. Moses is assistant professor of urologic surgery at Vanderbilt and chief urology uh, at Nashville General Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Dr. Moses is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Morehouse College and receives his MD and PhD from Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. He then completed his general surgery and urology training at Emory University and a fellowship in urologic oncology at the prestigious Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Uh, Dr. Moses, uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, and uh, next, I would like to introduce Dr. Adam Keibel. Uh, is the Chief of U Urology at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Dana Farber Brigham and Women's Cancer Center. In addition, he is an Elliot Carr Cutler Professor of Surgery at Harvard University School of Medicine and Chairman of the Harvard U Urology Residency Program. Dr. Keibel received his undergraduate and medical degrees from Cornell University. He completed his urology residency at the Harvard Urology Program and his fellowship at the Brady Urologic Institute at Johns Hopkins. And uh, Dr. Kyle said he would be a little late that he had a patient. And as a patient, I said, I understand you and appreciate your priorities, Dr. Kyle, but he will, 
he will join us in a bit. Uh, and now I would uh, also like to introduce you to uh, Dr. Keith Crawford. Uh, Dr. Crawford is the Director of Clinical Trials and Patient Education here at the Prostate Health Education Network. Dr. Crawford has over 20 years in the life sciences and completed his graduate and postgraduate training at Harvard Medical School, where he developed competencies in the areas of genomic, proteomics, immunology, microbiology, infectious disease, and regenerative medicine. And uh, Dr. Crawford, it's good to see you. I've seen you a few times today, but uh, welcome to the program this evening. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to kick this program off. Uh, Dr. Crawford is going to set the stage uh, uh, by providing an overview of the information uh, that, the, uh, that the American Cancer Society released. And then we're gonna ask Dr. Uh, Ezioni to really uh, dig into that and provide us a whole lot more details about this information. So Dr. Crawford, you're up. Thank you, Tom. Um, so this afternoon, especially what Tom said earlier, uh, there's new prostate cancer cases um, that for 2020 will increase upwards to 30%. Now, yes, this is alarming. And what we wanna do is we wanna give you some information that came from the American Cancer Society, as well as from the CDC to get us to think about it, to get the discussion started. Now, recently, American Cancer Society, and this is January, every year, the American Cancer Society comes out with their predictions as it relates to the number of cases related to all cancers in the United States. And in this case, what we do right in this chart here, we're just highlighting the top four cancers in the United States and it, prostate cancer, breast, uh, lung, and bronchus, which is categorized under uh, lung, and colorectal. In 2020, there was an estimated increase upwards to 192,000 um, new cases of prostate cancer. Um, now, the, the startling number is this increase between 2020, uh, from 2020 to 2021, to 248, thousand, close to 250,000 new cases. And in this case, if you look at the raw numbers, we're talking about over 56,000 new cases of prostate cancer. And this is a 29% jump. Now, if we look at breast, where there was a 51% increase in numbers of, of, of breast cancer, this represented 1.8%. Lung, a 6,900 a 6, case increase which represented about 3% of the, of a 3% increase. And then colorectal, about 1,500 new, new cases, um, which represented 1% um, increase over the year before. Now, what's startling is in addition to the fact that in one year, we have this 29% increase, um, predicted increase in prostate cancer, this number is, larger than the total not the total increase from 19 I mean from 2017 to 2020 now also we wanted to discuss or review some of the data that came from the, the CDC now this is data that was recently published um, at the end of the year of, of 2020 and what this data from the CDC morbidity mortality weekly report, um, from prostate cancer between 2003 and 2017 shows. We broke it up into three tables. One that gives you an idea of all what's happening with the whole population of prostate cancer patients in the United States. So there was somewhere above over between 2003 to 2017, over 3.1 million um, cases of prostate cancer. Now this graph um, on the y-axis is just to show that we're looking at numbers in the thousand, so in 2003, there were two, um, 202,000 cases. Now um, in 2003, which increased to in 2007 to 206,000 cases a year. 
Now this, if you just look at the, the, all the ethnic groups, all the men in the United States as a whole, it represents a 2% increase. Now, I recognize that there are other ethnic groups in the United States, but we just wanted to focus on um, compare Caucasian Americans with that of African Americans. And again, we're talking about numbers of thousands. So in 2003, the number of um, Caucasian American cases were 157,000. Now this number decreased in 2017 down to 145,000 cases. This is a 10% drop, 10% drop um, in the, from 2003 to 2017. But in contrast, if you look at the African-American table, again, we're talking about in thousands, we started in 2003 with 27,000 cases. And this, this number has increased to 32,000 cases in 2017. So here we have a 19% increase. So it's important for us to understand these numbers as it relates to um, how, we're, how ethnic groups, different groups are being impacted. And last, the American Cancer Society states this, finding prostate cancer early through PSA testing and advances in treatment help lower the death rate for prostate cancer by about 4% each year from the mid 1990s until 2013. But more recently between 2013 and 2018, the death rate is no longer dropping. So today we're gonna to try to shed some light on what's going on. Thank you, Tom. Dr. Crawford, uh, thank you for that information. And uh, so uh, I, again, I just wanna point out that uh, uh, anytime we hit numbers like a 30% increase, uh, those are numbers that are alarming as a prostate cancer survivor, uh, as a man with, uh, with uh, uh, two sons, uh, three grandsons. Uh, and and uh, you know, I'm looking out for the future as well. So I, I want to figure out what those numbers mean and how do we change those numbers for the future. So uh, Dr. Ezioni, uh, I'm going to call on you now uh, to uh, shed a little bit more light and depth to this discussion. Thank you, Tom. I put up a few slides to try to um, speak to the questions that have already ra been raised and to the um, discussion that we'll be having afterwards. Um, okay, great. Um, everyone can see that, I presume. So um, I, I had got, I actually hadn't seen the American Cancer Society numbers and uh, Tom um, contacted me last week or a couple of weeks ago now and um, told me about our, the webinar that we're going to have and to try to uh, try to shed some light on the numbers. And um, for those of you that are meeting me for the first time, I'm, as Tom mentioned, I am um, a statistician by profession and my, um, one of my missions in life is to get the numbers right. I think we're faced with so many numbers from different studies. We want to make um, good decisions as, as patients, as providers want to make good decisions for their patients. Policy makers want to make good decisions for the population, but we can't make good decisions without getting the numbers right. So um, I'll speak uh, about a, a whole bunch of numbers and I'm happy to um, talk more and, and answer more questions later. So this is, I'm going to repeat the, some of the information that Keith showed, although I'll go back to 2019. So every year the American Cancer Society releases these figures for the coming year. What I'm gonna talk about is where those numbers come from. So there, here are the numbers for the estimated new cases. Um, and so the 2019 number came out in January, 2019, 2020 came out in January, 2020. And here we are in 2021. Um, and so those are the year of the estimated new cases um, and the estimated deaths um, are predicted to go up slightly, but I wanna make a distinction between um, deaths and the death rate um, because um, the death rate of course is standardized to the population and the deaths um, are subject to, to changes 
in the population, changes in life expectancy. If you have an aging population, you can have the same death rate, but you can end up with more deaths. So um, when looking just at deaths, uh, it's sometimes hard to interpret the number. The death rate actually is here. Um, uh, the, I've got the hours pointing, it's multiple cancers. This comes from the American Cancer Society report. Um, and indeed, as Keith pointed out, the death rate has been declining and is now more or less plateauing. And, um, you know, it's interesting to think about why that may be the case and how bad of a, you know, how bad a news item is that, that um, death rates are plateauing. And I'll, I'll just say one thing, and we can talk about this certainly in our discussion after this, but we had, um, we, we had a lot of changes in prostate cancer um, practices. Of course, the big one being um, the, the adoption of prostate cancer screening and um, some changes in, in treatment, uh, certainly been, there were changes in um, surgery um, changes in radiation therapy has changed tremendously. Um, I often say to people, you can't say radiation because it's changed so much over time and we're able to deliver much more accurate, higher doses of radiation therapy and of course, hormonal and androgen receptor um, targeted therapies more recently. So um, absent changes in the population, the changes in deaths will follow changes in management and availability of screening and treatment. And so the, you know, there were big changes in screening. We've linked the drop in deaths to those changes in screening partially, and then screening saturated. Um, and uh, you know, many, many men were being screened. We can certainly always improve that, but I, I wouldn't say saturated, it's stabilized. So if screening goes up and then stabilizes, you'll see the effect of screening and then you'll see stabilization. So um, that plateau doesn't mean that we're not being effective. It, it means that we more or less have stabilized in those changes. So there, whenever we see changes in the population, we always wanna think about what's driving them. And I think it's very interesting to talk about mortality and we really need to distinguish between death rates and deaths because deaths are gonna change as the population ages and as the population composition changes. Now let's talk about the 2021 numbers for cases. Why is the 2021 number from the American Cancer Society so high? So the first thing to note is it's an estimate, right? It's a prediction for 2021. Something, so where, how do we predict for 2021? Well, something that I never realized, but makes sense and that I, is amazing to know is that the American Cancer Society predicts for next year, but they're predicting based on the most recent data that we have from the cancer registries, and it's three to four years old. So we actually don't even know today how many cases were diagnosed last year, 2019, 2018. Our most recent data from the registries is, is from 2017. So they're estimating 2021 based on 2017. But here's the big news. The way they do that estimation, that projection, I, I contacted them, I you know, talked to them about it. The method changed. And I believe that their result is because of a change in their method. Now you might say, well, the method changed for the other cancers as well. It changed for all the cancers. It changed for all the cancers that Dr. Crawford showed us. But the, the cancer that's hardest to predict, they tell me, is prostate. And I think I know why. And so when they changed their method, well, the other cancers were not so sensitive, but prostate was very sensitive to the change in their method and, and their number um, is very different than the past. So let's go back one year. So this is 2020, all right? And um, the blue is their um, data that they have on the numbers of prostate cancer cases each year. 
And for 2020, their data went to 2016. And so they, they projected based on data up to 2016 using their old method. And they got the number that we have, we've shown you for 2020, which is 191,000. So I said to them, did you use your new method to predict 2020? Uh, they said, no, we only used our new method to predict 2021. Based, so what for 2021, we have a new method and we have new data for 2017. So look at 2017. So 2017, the number went up quite a lot. And in addition to the, the data that they had showing more of an uptick, they also had a new method for projecting. And their new method really projects this last trend forward, essentially projects the last trend forward. So if you see this, you can see that the, it's, it's wiggly, but the last few points show an uptick. So the 2021 projection is just projecting, taking this uptick through and extrapolating it uh, several years. Now, when you do projections of the future, this reflects a very kind of common way that we predict the future. We predict the future based on our most recent past. That's what they're doing. But their previous method, I think, um, was not as sensitive to the recent past as their new method is. But you can only predict the future from the recent past if you think that you know, what's driving the recent past is also going to drive the future. And that's where I think we have the problem with prostate cancer. From my discussion with the investigators, they, as, I as I mentioned, they said the prostate cancer has always been difficult to predict. And, and this makes sense because prostate cancer trends are strongly affected by screening practices and rates. And they, affect incidence patterns. And they affect it in what I'll call a mechanistic way. Screening is like a wave. You know how a wave breaks and it pulls water from in front of it and it creates a peak and then it breaks. That's what screening does. Here's screening in a population. The screening test happens, it, it, there's, there's no screening and then it starts and it starts picking people out of the population and diagnosing them and every year, the plus is the number of screen detected cases. And then that's followed by deficits in the population. So pluses today or minuses tomorrow. And I pick people out of the population from the future. So I have an increase today, but that means a decrease later. And so I can't just project an increase from today forward. I need to understand what's happening in screening in the population. And in fact, there have been ch changes in screening, which I'll talk about in a moment. I just want to alert you to the fact that they acknowledge that they can't predict 2021. This is from their report, the American Cancer Society's report. They know that what happened in 2020 is going to affect what ultimately happened in 21. But they don't even have the data of 2020 yet to know what really happened. They only have the data from 2017. So they, they anticipate, and I think we can anticipate, as far as prostate cancer for 2021 goes, we may have um, um, actually many prostate cancer cases in 21 because of delays in preventive care from 2020. And we may also have higher mortality because we know that treatments were delayed, not just prevention and screening, but primary treatments were delayed in 2020. And so we're very concerned about this. But again, we never see the data in real time unless we're looking in specific institutions. So just before I end, I just wanna go back to my point about screening behavior. What happens today, right, affects tomorrow. So this is a paper by Kanzler et al. that a couple of months ago in JNCI, where they looked at the behavioral risk factor surveillance system to actually track screening behavior post the US Preventive Services Task Force D recommendation. And they have it overall and by age, and the blue here is, um, is um, African-American men. And 
Particularly um, in the younger age group, you can see that there's quite a drop off in screening. And this, this actually likely partly explained the downturn early in earlier in, uh, to in, in, in the years before 2017. Um, but when you stop, when you stop screening, initially incidents will go down, but then cases will start to build up and incidents will go up. So I want to just actually go back here. So you can see here, you see how cases have gone down after 2012 as screening activity declined. But then what happens is that cases build up because they're not being detected by screening anymore and you'll see an upturn. And so screening in prostate cancer has effects today that are different from the effects tomorrow. And that's what makes it very difficult for the American Cancer Society to do a good job predicting prostate cancer. Now, I wanna just talk a little about um, uh, the what to do um, in the African-American population and the situation with disparities because I'm looking towards our discussion. Um, the paper that I've found fascinating and that we're, we're really looking into is this, this 2016 paper in European Urology. And what I'm showing you here is um, they looked at the incidence of prostate cancer that they said turn out to be fatal, um, was followed by death within 10 years. And they looked at the um, black white disparity by age. And what they found is they found a much worse disparity among younger men. Um, certainly a disparity across the board but the rates, relative rates were higher of um, incidence of fatal prostate cancer among younger men. And this is very consistent with something we've been saying for some time and are becoming more vocal about is that African-American men um, need to start screening earlier um, than the recommended age for white men. And so this is an editorial that we wrote about that paper um, that national guidelines need to be very explicit for this high-risk population and no more uh, wishy-washy national guidelines. And we have explicit recommendations, and this is a forthcoming article in JNCI, is not only to start earlier, but to screen more frequently, uh, but then among older men, because of the high incidence of prostate cancer, there are very high rates of overdiagnosis. So once you get to age 70 uh, and older, to, to, you, you, to, to be not necessarily to stop screening, although that's is one that option, the, but to certainly that, become that, that more conservative. Screen. And this is the forthcoming analysis. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. So I'll that. stop there and looking towards our conversation and hope that I've been able to clarify for you um, why these numbers are coming out the way they are, to recognize that they're not data, that they're estimates, and that um, there's a reason why it's hard to predict for prostate cancer, because what's happening today is, is typically does not portend what will happen you know, in, in the coming years. What's happening this year, if prostate cancer is going down because men are stopping screening, that ultimately the number of cases will build up in the population and incidents will go up after. And the American Cancer Society just does not do a good job predicting for prostate cancer. And I asked them, do you ever go back and check whether your predictions match the observed numbers? And they're not doing that enough. I'm gonna to try to encourage them to do that because we may find that the last couple of years also were off. So thank you, Tom, and I'll hand over the podium. Thank you, Dr. Eziane. Uh, just one question before I hand it off to uh, Dr. Moses and Dr. Kybel. Uh, so how much stock should we put in those numbers? Well, it's interesting because, you know, we may end up having a quite a high number this year. Uh -huh. But the, I think that will be partially due to a lower number last year, uh, 2020. Um, so, you know, they may fortuitously actually turn out to be reasonable, but not for the reasons that they predicted. 
I, I don't think they're very reliable. I, I would not worry. Uh, I would not worry as much about that that number as um, it, I, I think it's 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 less reliable um, than we might hope. Okay. All right. Good. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Moses, uh, could we get your perspective and input on these numbers and uh, the information that Dr. Etienne just presented? <laughs> well, I'll start out by saying that Dr. Crawford and Dr. Etzioni are about 100 times smarter than I am. So I appreciate their, their statements. Um, I agree that the numbers, an estimate is an estimate. And so it's not an exact number, of course. Um, we, in the clinical world, we did see fewer people coming in getting screened for prostate cancer. And as people start getting back out to see their physicians, you're going to naturally see a jump in the numbers. Um, whether that one year difference uh, ends up translating into a mortality difference, I'm not sure. We, it would be 20 years before we know that. But we, are, we will see a stage migration because someone who had high risk localized or regional cancer last year that didn't know it and presents now, um, there is a good chance that they will, will present with um, you know, more advanced disease. So I would not be surprised that we see uh, a significant change in the percent of people presenting with, with stage four cancer uh, as a de novo disease. You know, the difference in death between black and white men it has been durable for decades. And even though the trends in mortality mirrored each other uh, as far as direction over time, that gap remained stable. And that gap is the difference in uh, treatment uh, that black men receive or lack thereof. I mean, there's been plenty of papers that show that black men when diagnosed with prostate cancer are less likely to receive treatment. And when they do more likely to receive substandard treatment. Um, the screening difference between black and white men probably also plays a role. Um, and it may not be that as big as, as treatment does. Um, but what that gap shows is, and, it, and the gap is actually pretty consistent. And, and, and what it shows is that uh, there is a consistent roadblock in the provision of medical care uh, that has not changed over the decades. Um, that goes to what we see in that only 3% of United States physicians are black, which is actually lower than it was in the late 70s. You have fewer black men in medical school now than in 1973. Uh, you, uh, in, in urology and medical oncology in particular, you have drastically uh, declining numbers of African-American physicians. And so it's sort of a, uh, a perfect storm when it comes to uh, the outcomes of black men when it comes to treatment uh, that they receive and, and, and from whom they receive it. Okay, uh, Dr. Kybel, welcome. And um, thank you for uh, having me. I see Dr. Ezioni referenced one of your papers. Uh, I know. So, so we'd we'd love to get your inputs on this discussion. Well, I mean, it's always hard to follow Ruth because she's uh, she's always always says everything so much better than I could ever say it, and I'm always nervous to say something, and then she'll she'll figure out I, she knows more about this than I do. I, I want to echo a lot of what uh, 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 Kelvin said, Dr. Moses, about uh, the disparities we see between African Americans and Caucasians, which I think has been exacerbated by COVID. Uh, I mean, we, we could hit on the fact there's probably some genetics going on, though uh, I'm not always convinced of that. Uh, clearly, there are uh, differences in screening uh, and treatment, which have a huge impact. Uh, but, uh, you know, COVID has disproportionately affected. Uh, 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 groups of uh, individuals of color uh, in, in our society. Uh, as a result, these are individuals that are concentrating on uh, protecting themselves economically uh, from uh, the, 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 the impact uh, if they're in an environment where they're not as wealthy uh, and, uh, and also of uh, dealing with the virus. 
and they're not spending their time worrying about prostate cancer and being screened. And even uh, if they are worried about things like this, they're much less likely to be in areas where uh, they have access to, uh, to, uh, to, to virtual medicine, which has really become an important tool, but one that I think is a huge negative impact in terms of uh, screening patients, period, for cancer, uh, but also a negative impact uh, disproportionately, again, against individuals of, uh, of color in our, in, our, in our society. And so I worry that uh, I, I got to hear the end of what Ruth said, and, and, and I very much uh, agree with her about this wave phenomenon. I've never really thought about it that way, but I think it is conceptually an incredibly powerful uh, way of, of thinking about this. And I worry that the trough is going to be very deep in, in, uh, in our population. And, and then, the, unfortunately, the peak will be very high. Uh, and uh, I'm sure Ruth is right now thinking about how to model the two different populations to demonstrate that that wave is going to be different. I think it's going to be a tsunami uh, in, uh, in, in the population at, heart, at large, and I think it's going to be a super tsunami in people that are disadvantaged. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one of the interesting uh, uh, bits of data that Dr. Croft showed was that uh, uh, how, uh, I guess it was uh, since 2003 and 2017, uh, we've actually had a, a decline in uh, new cases uh, for white men, but we, we have an increase in number, 19% increase for, for black men. And, uh, you know, through that period of time, uh, the disparity has increased. Uh, when, when I first began talking about this disparity, we talked about a 60, 66% disparity. That disparity rate has now gone up by 10%. Uh, uh, so uh, what do we expect to happen now, and and I guess maybe you said it, Dr. Kaiba. You said that that would be a tsunami, so maybe that is the tsunami. Well, I think I think what we're probably going to see, and I'm I'm very interested in the other people in the group. Uh, we'll probably see a deeper trough, uh, and then uh, once the trough is is finished, we're going to see a much uh, higher wave, uh, which I think. Uh, unfortunately, will not be a lot of localized prostate cancer. It's going to be a lot of locally advanced and metastatic disease. Uh, and uh, I think managing these patients effectively and convincing them that they should undergo effective uh, uh, aggressive therapy, I think, is a task that uh, we all have. And I think uh, it was very nicely uh, outlined by Kelvin that we don't have a lot of uh, individuals in urology who can speak to the personal uh, experiences of uh, individuals who are coming in worried about the cancer, but also worried about potency, worried about continence, and, and worried about the things that all men are worried about. And they want to look at somebody who they trust and they value. And I obviously think that, uh, you know, skin color shouldn't impact on that. But I think when people walk into their office, they want to feel that uh, they're seeing somebody who reflects their view of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, as a physician, that's uh, and as a as a uh, larger, uh, you know, our physicians community, we need to reflect that to allow them to get the best possible care. I'm curious uh, what the other panelists think about that concept of a much deeper trough and a much higher uh, a wave, and also what things we can do to mitigate that. Uh, maybe I don't know if we want to raise the trough, but certainly dampen the wave and ensure people get the best possible care. Well, the wave, the, the wave is going to go um, parallel the return of men to their, um, you know, to, to their uh, early detection routine. Um, and, and, and as we've seen in the last few years, really, that it's dropped off um, recent screening. And so I think that we have, um, you know, work to do, uh, particularly in the, in the African-American community, to bring men back to... Um, to screening and um, to um, you know help convince them that this is essentially an important part of their routine preventive care. Uh, it's it's not optional in in this population. It's 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 got to you know and but but again, then I think that it uh, screening can only be can only do its job if it's followed by uh, proper confirmation of positive results and appropriate um, primary treatment, but also something that I think we know much less about is what's happening. Um, and maybe you have, you or, or um, Dr. Moses might have some insight into what's happening in the post-primary treatment landscape. 
are we seeing the same um, you know, lack of appropriate intervention and timely, it's important to have timely intervention in, this, in the setting of recurrent of recurrence in the African American population, because if we are, then we need to start thinking about efforts in the post treatment landscape too. Dr. Moses, any any comments on that? Yeah, I think you know the the challenges that men face pre treatment or pre diagnosis are the same that they face uh, face post diagnosis, mm. and. Um, you know, we've seen already uh, in one of the graphs that you showed how um, the, the, there's a greater percentage of younger black men that are diagnosed with prostate cancer. And even if they get treated and 10, 15 years down the road, uh, there's recurrence. If they have not transitioned to Medicare age by then because they were starting out at this younger age, uh, then they still might not get treated. Right. Um, and uh, until you cross that 65-year-old thresh mm. uh, threshold, um, mm. you could still be left out. And if you're diagnosed at 42, uh, you know, biochemical recurrence can happen anywhere from, you know, one to 15 years, uh, 20 years. But at 20 years and you're still late 50s or early 60s, um, uh, you know, it still poses quite a challenge. Uh -huh. Yeah, one of the uh, things that we uh, that we're planning to do that we have started uh, is a very aggressive uh, education programs about early detection uh, and treatments. In fact, we've developed uh, a portal. We just released one for screening, and you know that's that's always a controversial uh, issue. But we we looked at the different guidelines from uh, ACS, from the task force, NCCN, uh, AUA. Uh, and uh, we, we think we did it right. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't violate any of those, we don't think. Uh, and we, we provided guidance. So we're gonna do a, a lot of work in outreach and educate, education about early detection. Uh, and, and also we, uh, we introduced uh, a few months ago, uh, another tool, uh, online tool, which we call FinPath to educate about uh, treatment pathways and treatment options within those different pathways. Uh, and uh, because, you know, we talk with men uh, uh, continuously and we see firsthand uh, the need for that level of education. Uh, we still see too many men that, that are not getting screening or don't understand it or, after, or very frankly, very confused. They are confused as to what to do. And, uh, and then when men are diagnosed, uh, they really don't have a handle on on, on what to do or where they should begin the whole process of looking at, at, uh, at, at, at treatments. And uh, we use the NCCN treatment guideline uh, uh, as a basis for, for that guidance. Uh, so we see a, a, so much work that needs to be done in these areas. And, and not only that, we're doing work in clinical trials, but uh, it, it's just a, it's a, it's a big task, a, a, a lot of work to be done. And as I look at these, uh, as I look at these numbers and listen to, uh, to what you're saying, you're saying, hey, well, uh, we do expect men to be uh, maybe diagnosed at a later stage, maybe at an earlier age. So for an organization like ours, what, what, what do we need to do? <laughs> because already it is a very challenging task uh, to, uh, to reach out and educate uh, the public. And that's the reason we were so uh, interested. We want to have this discussion uh, about this 30% uh, uh, increase in new cases uh, because it wasn't clear to us uh, just where that was coming from. So uh, we have a better fix on that. Yeah, Tom, I wanted to make one uh, comment. And I, I did have the luxury of going back and looking at um, one of the um, charts that I have reflects 2017, and this is from the United States uh, Cancer t t Statistics that the um, CDC summarized. And at that time, that means that's the number of cases that existed that they were able to count. So they report about 206,000 cases. But if you go back to the 2017 predictions of uh, American Cancer Society, 
American Cancer Society was predicting 161. So if we just look at those numbers, because this is where it crosses over, if we're looking at that number, we're, we're looking about a 44,000 or 44,000 new cases, which reflects almost like a 72% um, difference between what one was predicting and what the reality of the situation was in 2017. So if that's the case, then it is alarming about what can potentially happen. And at least we're, we're having this discussion right now to not just sit here, but to try to formulate some kind of roadmap to kind of decrease or prevent this huge trough that could potentially take place. So what, what, what that data shows is that uh, this 30% increase may be underestimated based yeah. upon history, then, is that right? Yeah, and then we clearly don't understand, I mean, the rule of thumb is like, well, you got your general population is 30%. So in the African-American community, especially in the chronic diseases, it may double the amount. So you're seeing 30% in the African-American population, you may see anywhere between 50 and above, 50% to 60% um, uh, increased incidence. And we still haven't talked about COVID. So. Okay, uh, does anybody wanna comment on that? And then we will get into some of the questions. Yeah, um, yeah. so I, I wanted was, to mention the questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was gonna say one other thing. I, it, one of the things that I've unfortunately learned over the past 10 years in a leadership role is never waste a crisis. So COVID is a crisis and allows us to reanalyze and reaffirm our commitment to screening people for prostate cancer. And I think the forced lack of screening that's gonna occur during the COVID is gonna demonstrate how important screening for prostate cancer actually is. And then we need to ensure that we don't overtreat the patients who have low risk prostate cancer and truly focus on the people that have high risk potentially lethal disease. When we learn from this lesson that screening is actually important and does save lives. Okay. Yeah, and I will say that I, I think I think I'm not in a clinical practice, but um, you know we have always been concerned about disparities in prostate cancer. The racial disparity in prostate cancer is the greatest racial disparity in cancer. Um, but you know more systemically, I, I I think that COVID has put into huge sharp relief. Um, the disparities in outcomes um, among minority patients. And what we need to take from this is we need to do more for our minority patients. Um, and, you know, when we were, I was working with the Washington State Department of Health thinking about vaccine strategies, you know, I, I, I was advocating we need to vac vaccinate minority patients first. Mm -hmm. um, and you know we need to, and, and our, our our recommendations for a screening African American men are to do more in this population. And if there's anything we we need to reset from this pandemic, and what we need to take forward is that we need to be doing more for these high risk populations. And um, African American men and prostate cancer is a classic example. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to. I'll begin to bring forward some questions. Uh, I have one, and and uh, uh, Rupa, I think this may be for you. I'm not sure you have the answer. What would the prostate cancer projection look like utilizing the old standard? Uh, you, you, you mean, what do the prostate cancer projections look like? What would the prostate cancer projections look like utilizing the old standard? I know that, well, that's what I asked them. <laughs> and I think that it would be a much, a much, um, much more, much, uh, much closer to what they projected for 2020. In the same way, you know, if you kind of look at their projections for 19 to 20, um, it was about a 10% increase. So I think it would have been something of that order. Um, okay. When I asked them about the old methodology, they had a very time, hard time explaining it. They said it kind of looks for waves. <laughs> But that's all really, it's, a, it, it's more of a smooth, I'd say it's more of a smooth um, trend that incorporates more of the history. Whereas the new approach incorporates the latest, you know, the last few points. And since the last few points are now going up, um, you know, it's going to project up. So I think it would have been a lot closer to 2020. Okay. But, uh, you know, I make this point based upon the information that Dr. Crawford just uh, presented about how the uh, 
uh, the estimates were underestimated uh, but relative to actual data. Uh, maybe they were felt that they were so far off with the old standard that they had to make this change. Uh, just a just a supposition. <laughs> Uh, Can I just uh, say that um, I just want to say that their new methods and their old methods are very similar for deaths. Okay. So for cases, um, is less confidence, but for um, for deaths, there's more confidence. Okay. I have another question here. Why don't providers suggest PSA to African American men at age 40 with annual checkup? I know uh, uh, Dr. Moses, Dr. Eziona, and Dr. Kaibol. Uh, we spent a lot of time on this question on the. Uh, on the on the NCCN early detection panel, so I don't know who wants to who wants to jump into that question. Well, I think part of it, you know, guidelines panels, um, by definition and probably by recommendation, are 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 guided to not make drastic moves um, because. Um, it, it it takes a long time for for change to occur. Um, I know back when I was in medical school, they said it took 17 years for uh, a new paradigm and treatment to become the gold standard. I don't, I don't know if it takes that long now. Um, part of it too, though, is that in the, in the internal medicine family practice world, PSA is still a bad word. I, I, don't, I don't care what people say. I, and I've had family med medicine residents that rotate with me and I mentioned screening and they're like, oh yeah, we don't do that. And it was almost like, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was just a flippant answer. Um, and when I asked them to try to come up with data or, you know, literature or an argument for it, it, it really didn't matter because it was, that was the paradigm. So I think it, it still takes uh, groups such as Finn and others to go to the, the internal medicine world and say, you know, we've got some interesting data. Yeah, there's some kind of conflicting data and there, there's, some, there's some question, but we've, we've also updated what we do. As urologists, um, you know, we kind of shot ourselves in the foot by radiating and prostatectomizing everybody who got just the tiniest little bit of cancer. Um, and so that, that polluted the conversation. But with the use of advanced imaging, with the use of actor surveillance, I think we sort of obviated that and, and we've kind of moved on from, from that era. And I think that needs to be taken into account when these guidelines panels meet. Uh, you know, when you talk about the harms of screening, you're supposed to talk about the harms of screening, not everything else downstream from it. And that's where you know, particularly USPSTF, they, they extrapolated so far down the line that it almost lost the whole point of a screening recommendation. Right. Okay, I have another question. Is the drop-in screening COVID related and is a PSA test the most effective? Uh, Dr. Kaibel, yeah. what, what are your thoughts on that? So my thoughts, I think there is a drop in screening due to COVID. I'm interested to see how it all turns out because I mean, the best data uh, screening study, in my opinion, is the one from uh, Europe where the screening interval was not yearly, but every two years. Uh, and uh, so I, I think what we're gonna be seeing is, uh, 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 as was just outlined nicely by Dr. Moses, uh, a, 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 a a decision not to screen in the family practice and primary care uh, community, particularly among younger physicians, not older physicians, and layered on top of that COVID. And I think we will see an impact of COVID, but if people were screening regularly, I think we would have seen no impact on COVID because all we'd be doing was delaying it a short period of time. Uh, so uh, I think that answered your question. I think there were two parts to your question. What was the second part of the question? Uh... Let me go back to that question. Right. Is a PSA test the most effective? Uh, yeah, so if I had to choose, I think PSA, and obviously I'm biased, 
being a urologist, but I think it's probably the best tumor marker that we have. I think the main problem with PSA was its indiscriminate use. Uh, the high number of men that are being screened, you know, in their late 70s and early 80s, uh, and a failure to screen, uh, particularly as outlined quite nicely here, you know, younger men who are predisposed to it, either due to family history, genetic background, or, or ethnic, ethnicity. Uh, and I think if we had a better uh, targeted screening of men in high risk groups uh, and less screening in men who are unlikely to benefit from it, it would actually improve its ability to diagnose prostate cancer. So that's the long answer. The short answer is yes, it's a good test. Is it perfect? No, but it's good. Okay. Um, I have another question. In fact, we probably have more questions than we will have a chance to, to answer. Uh, but what is happening at the primary care provider level? Are they doing PSAs based on age or is it based on family history or symptoms? Are federally qualified health centers doing PSAs? Anybody uh, uh, wanna, wanna talk about that? We, well, we think the primary provider uh, community isn't doing, <laughs> we're, we're not sure what they're doing the screening based upon, to be very honest with you. Yeah, I don't, doing I don't think it's consistent. I mean, right. um, it could, it, it could be all of that for sure. When you, you know, they mentioned the federally funded uh, community centers, those, per, those are usually primarily serving uh, black or Hispanic populations. And I think there's a, a little bit more of a sensitivity about uh, the, the population there. Um, the, I'm here in Nashville and, and one of our large centers, Matthew Walker Center, I know that they do perform PSA screening. Um, so, I, and I, I've practiced at Grady Hospital in Atlanta and, and some other places. And so I think in, in predominantly uh, underserved uh, community serving institutions, there is a sensitivity for that. As far as what is done in the primary care world, I think it's inconsistent um, it is the most fair statement I think I can make. Okay. I was gonna say, I think it's very frequently if the patient asks to be screened, they get screened. If they don't ask to be screened, they're not screened, which I think is unfortunate. and really boils down to uh, the, the important work that, that you're doing, Tom, in terms of educating you know, people out there that they need to get a PSA test. We, we, the bane of all of our existence uh, is, I'm gonna bring up a dirty word, is EPIC and the LMR, right? Any physician cringes uh, at it. We've actually tried to leverage our LMR to tell primary care physicians that they need to screen patients and not to screen patients. You know, if someone has a normal PSA and they're 75 years old and their last PSA was 0.5, the, the LMR says, hey, do you really wanna get a PSA on this guy? And if someone's uh, African-American and they're 45 years old and it pings them and says, hey, you haven't gotten a PSA in a couple of years, do you wanna get a PSA? And we found that that really has, we're, we're gonna publish that data soon, has shifted the curve. So we're not screening as many older patients who aren't gonna benefit. And we're screening younger patients that are actually at risk. That we won't discover as many cancers, but we'll discover more meaningful cancers. Mm -hmm. I have uh, another question that's very interesting. Uh, you emphasize the importance of screening, but this is against the American Medical Association guidelines of a few years ago that recommend a reduction in PSA exam. How do we square physicians saving costs relative to this discrepancy? Well, I think that that's because we don't have tailored guidelines for African-American men. I think for the general population, I think there's a case to be made um, that at some point there was, uh, you know, um, I want more of a treatment than over screening, but I, I mean, I, I think that we need tailored gu uh, guidance. And I think that um, what's, what I think what people, even though we recommend you know, annual screening, I think that what people um, need to understand is that um, it doesn't have to be annual to be beneficial. It can be very beneficial every couple of years. You know, one can, we don't have to overdo it. 
But I think that what people do need to realize is that you know, screening is the first step on a slope. And you know, people sometimes ask me whether they should get a screening test. And I said, you know, don't get a test if you're not willing not to be treated because there is a lot of prostate cancer that is overtreated. Um, and in all populations, this can happen. And people, what I'm trying to say is when you go in to, I, I think it's very important for African-American men to be screened and it's very important for them to understand that it's to, 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 to learn about what it means and what the results mean and to really become enabled to self-advocate in the system by being educated about um, the, the complexities. It's, it's, it's not straightforward. And I think maybe that's a, a big barrier is maybe people know that it is, this is not um, straightforward, but it's true for every screening test. It's true for a mammogram too. You know, the screen is the first step and there are things happen after that that you have to be prepared for when you do the first step. Uh, that's my answer to that question. Uh, Tom, did you want to comment as it relates to um, NCCN guidelines compared to United States um, Preventive Medicine Task Force? Because the, the task force has addressed, uh, commented on the need for shared decision making and more discussion about uh, with African American men about testing. They don't really say how far back or how young you should go. I, I, I wanted to know what your thoughts are about the NCCN guidelines that clearly draw a line in the sand that says, look, if you're 40, you need to be tested. If you're an African-American, you're at high risk. If you're an African-American, you need to be tested. So that's, they have basically drawn a line in the sand that says everybody needs to be tested, but we're still kind of wobbling back and forth with the United States, uh, uh, with the task force. Any thoughts on that? Well, Clearly, the, the task force kind of uh, turned over the apple cart in, uh, in 2012. They kicked it over, turned over, threw away the apples, uh, and said that no man need to be, should be screened. The PSA test was, was not uh, effective. Uh, and I think we're all trying to recover uh, from that point. Now, as we know, back in 2018, they changed that from a D recommendation to a C recommendation and that men should, uh, should begin uh, uh, shared decision-making with their doctors uh, at the age of, uh, I think, age of 50, 55. Uh, and uh, during that time, well, we fought very hard to have them bifurcate uh, their recommendations based upon men at high risk and men at, uh, at average risk, which they did not do. But within the details of their recommendation, if you look closely, they do state clearly that uh, uh, African-American men who are at high risk uh, should consider uh, screening uh, at an earlier age. And, uh, and so, you know, as, as I mentioned, we have just uh, uh, released what we call FIN PSA. And I will put this up, FINPSA.com. Uh, and uh, and uh, with our approach to, uh, early detection screening for African-American men. And we, within that, we really list the recommendations. Uh, okay, you, you can see it there. We, we, we list the recommendation uh, uh, for uh, the current recommendation for the task force, the current recommendation for NCCN, uh, ACS and AUA. And, uh, and within that, uh, we recommended African-American men began having these discussions about screening at the age of 40. And we don't think we violate any of those recommendations. Uh, we're using a more aggressive approach uh, for African-American men, uh, but uh, each, one of those, uh, each one of those guidelines allows for you to begin that discussion of screening at age 40. What I want to do, we've had, uh, I think, a great, and I wanted to finish by 7.15, and we're going to do that. Uh, but I want to... Uh, certainly thank our guests for taking the time to be with us uh, and uh, presenting the information uh, to, to an audience. Uh, we have a good sized audience. We have a live audience. This is live on uh, Facebook. We will promote this on Facebook at a later date. 
so we would expect to get a good coverage of this uh, of this webinar. So Dr. Ezioni, uh, Dr. Moses, Dr. Kybal, and Dr. Crawford, thank you so very much for your spending time with us this evening. Now, I want to end and, and I want to thank our audience. I want to thank all of you for being with us. I want to thank you for all your questions. We didn't answer all the questions, but uh, we think some were kind of uh, similar to others. So we think we answered the, we hit all the topical areas. Uh, <clears throat> if you uh, if you think your question is, wasn't answered, uh, uh, please email me. I'm going to give you my personal email address, thomas at prostatehealthed.org. And if you think we didn't answer your question properly, send it to me and I'll make sure that we get back to you. But one of the things that uh, when I put up the information about our different programs with early detection, with treatments and clinical trials, one of the things that we have uh, been blessed with uh, since our founding in 2003 is, is a number of uh, church partners and leaders from across the country that really helps us do our work. Uh, we've been at uh, in Tennessee with Dr. Moses. Uh, we've been all over the country. And I'm going to end this program with a message from one of our partners, uh, Dr. Howard John Wesley, who is a senior pastor of Apple Street uh, Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. So uh, we're going to play that now. And this is the way we'll end. When I turned 40, that was a huge moment for me in my life because my father died at 80. And I believe that 40 could be the midway point of my life. So I decided at 40, I was going to try to get myself together. Part of my getting myself together, I got me a new primary care physician, went to see her, and as with any good physician, we started with an interview. She started asking me about my own health. To my surprise, she then asked me about my father's health. I told her that my father died at 80. She asked me what my father died of. I told her prostate cancer. She sat down and started writing. Has anyone else in your family had prostate cancer? I said to her, yes, my grandfather died of prostate cancer. All of my uncles died of prostate cancer. She was writing. She looked up. She said, Howard, your father had it. Your grandfather had it. All of your uncles died from it. And this is what she said to me. You're more than likely going to get prostate cancer. Y'all, I was devastated. I sat in that office and almost began to cry, realizing that the same thing that took out my father and my grandfather and my uncles was probably going to take me out. And then I began to worry, am I passing it on to my sons? And I'm sitting there in tears. And the Lord used my doctor as an angel and preacher in my life. She saw me crying and she said, but wait a minute, Howard, that doesn't mean you have to just die from it. That doesn't mean you have to lose to it. As a matter of fact, this is what she said. She said, you can fight it right now. Even though it's generational, you can do something to fight it right now. She said, right now, you can change your diet. Right now, you can start exercising every day. Right now, you can get your annual exams. Right now, you can start to fight what you think is generational. Don't give in to it just because it's generational, but stand up and fight it. And I don't know who I came to encourage today, but I want you to know no matter what it looks like in your past, no matter how many of your family dealt with it, no matter how generational it looks, you can fight it right now. And God says, it does not have to be the same curse to you.